Um, welcome everyone to the uh, to the second installment of Emerging Manager Monthly and the Diverse Asset Managers Initiatives Joint Webinar Series. Um, my name is Lindsay Siani, and I'm Associate Editor of EMM, and I'm excited to be moderating today's panel. Um, the goal with this webinar series uh, is to tackle the state of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the asset management industry. And today's topic will focus specifically around how to enhance DEI um, among endowment and foundation managers. Um, please note that attendees are able to submit questions um, in the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom screen, um, which we will be getting to some of those questions later. Um, today's esteemed panelists include Jagdeep Bashir, Chief Investment Officer and Vice President of Investments at the University of California, and Brian O'Neill, former Chief Investment Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We will also have featured commentary from Dami Founder and Executive Director Robert Rabin and EMM Managing Editor Matt McHugh. To give some background on our panelists, Jagdeep has been with the University of California for nine years, where he manages the pension, endowment, retirement savings, and working capital investment pools. Before joining the UC system, Jagdeep had stints at AIMCO, JH Investments, and Manulife, just to name a few. Um, Brian was the CIO at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for 20 years, guiding the foundation's investment strategy with innovative leadership. In this role, he was responsible for the foundation's considerable investment portfolio, which was valued at $11.4 billion when his tenure concluded. Jagdeep and Brian, welcome, and we are uh, happy to have you today. Thank to you. kind of uh, jump right in, um, we can kind of open with the first question. You know, the, the DEI gap in the field of asset management is possibly the least talked about crisis facing the financial services sector. From your perspectives as CIOs who have collectively managed more than $200 billion in investments, what do you see as the biggest roadblocks to meaningful change? And what do you see as the best practices for improvement? Um, let's start with Jack Deep. Thank you for having me and thank you for organizing this today. Um, I can see we've got a few hundred uh, participants on and I wanna acknowledge everyone on my team uh, here in Oakland and, and wherever they are because I get the opportunity to speak on behalf of UC Investments, but the, the work is a collective effort of an entire team. And when you can build a culture in an organization to be focused around thinking equitably in a diverse way, and um, looking for new opportunities, uh, it really becomes a powerful combination. So thank you to the team and everybody else uh, attending today. Um, the, you know, this is, is there really a problem here with the fact that in asset management, uh, we don't have uh, more diverse managers? I think the short way to look at it is if at least 95% or more of the assets being managed in the world today, or at least in the United States are through or, or in organizations that have white men, primarily in leadership roles, I think it's pretty clear. You, you don't have to sort of figure out that there is a problem with a diversity of who is managing those assets and representing those assets. So I think that's, that's one thing to keep in mind, uh, which then means there is an incredible opportunity. The bar is so low in terms of where we're at right now that it can only get better from here in terms of adding more diverse managers and recognizing that that's something that needs to be done. But that's the second part, recognizing that something needs to be done. You gotta first start with the problem. And as long as you acknowledge the problem, then you're gonna do something about it. I think one of the challenges is a lot of us recognize there is a problem, but it becomes overwhelming to think about how do you fill up that ocean of asset management with more diverse managers because it's such a big task in some ways. And, and to address that, I think you, you've got to look at ways of, you know, being intentional about doing that. And that means you start, you know, charity always begins at home. Don't try to give advice to people outside your organization. Look within yourself as an individual and look within your organization. So for me, this has been a journey over the last um, almost six or so years as we've been very focused on thinking about how we can do a better job even if it's in a small way, but make a difference. Um, 
And and as that as that uh, journey has been evolving, we've realized a couple of things. First of all, you need good data to be able to figure out where you're at right now. And the best advice I think I got early on from Robert uh, was there are many organizations that are doing a fantastic job. But if you don't know where your baseline is that you're starting from, then you don't necessarily realize how much progress you've actually made on this journey. And so you got to figure out where your starting point is. And I think for us, that journey began four years ago explicitly to gather the data and to try and standardize it for our own organization and then, then measure where we're at to figure out how we can make progress. The second thing is after we came out with our first report, Robert made it very clear that that's nice, but it's not enough. And the reason it's not enough, and at the time I thought, wow, we had gone through such a monumental task to put together our data. But this last week I was in New York at uh, an event uh, organized by Reverend Sharpton, the National Action Network, and he said something that resonated with me. He said, each one of us can make a wave on our own, but all the waves together make up the ocean. And I may think that this one wave is excellent, that we're making at UC Investments, but the reality, we all need to work together. And that's why it's not enough to have data just from one organization, but everyone needs to put their data out there so we can collectively make progress and, and boil this ocean and make a difference. So that's the second thing I would say is around data when you start to become intentional about it. The third thing is that, you know, honestly, we're all human beings. This is a people business. This is a people problem and it's a people opportunity. And what that means is when you look within your organizations, you have to look for structural biases or systemic problems that might exist that have limited one's ability to add more diverse managers into the mix of our asset management pool. And I think that starts with, you gotta think about, do people have biases? The answer is yes, we all do, including myself. Um, Therefore, we need training. We need to change our mind. We need to open our horizons to think about how those biases can impact the decisions we make. And all of that stuff needs to be done within your organization. And that's why when you're adventuring in this journey, it can't be just the leader like myself or Brian. It has to be organizational wide. And so for me, the most important thing has been to make sure anything we do and anything we try to do is focused on trying to include as many people in our organization to be part of that process, because then we can have a multiplier effect on the change we're trying to make. And then of course, the next thing is, once you start to make some of those adjustments, you start to realize, you know what? I really don't have enough diverse managers in my pool of assets. How do I get access to them? That's where the Diverse Asset Management Institute comes into play. That's where the National Action Network, the National Association of Investment Companies, um, or or other um, you know Afrotech or conferences out there, there are a lot of organized communities and networks where diverse managers find an opportunity to go and network and and have access and connect. Then you need to open up your own networking to those organizations, and we've tried some of that. We've worked on some of that, and that pipeline has helped us add more into our mix. But then one of the things you also realize is everyone says there's a pipeline problem. What's the pipeline problem? Well, there aren't enough asset management professionals out there. There aren't enough individuals out there. There aren't enough women or people of color or you know African-Americans or black or Latino or Asian-Americans out there that we can fund. Well, I'll tell you what, I live in California. California is a majority minority state. There's no questions about that. The University of California represents the demographics of California. We also are a majority minority student population. And when you put all that together, it turns out we have a pipeline factory that is better than any organization out there that can have one. And that's where we realize we've got the biggest opportunity to make a difference. 300,000 students, 250,000 faculty and staff. So this, journey led to the creation of something called the UC Investments Academy. And I know Craig Huey is watching this today. Craig has been the architect of spearheading this effort for us all across the University of California. And our goal over the next five years is to take 10,000 of our students and work them through 
giving them access and network and community and training so they are better prepared to go into the financial services industry. What's the data show on the academy today? We're two years into it and we're at 800. Our three campuses where we're most active are UC Merced, UC Riverside, and UC Davis. Why? Because they happen to be in Central California where we naturally are gonna pick up a very diverse population. That's why we're starting there to try and have an impact on our goal of trying to get to 10,000 10, students. So as we've been going through this journey of being intentional, gathering the data, setting up the baseline, and making sure that we internally change our own mindset and our culture, take the biases out of the equation, and then focus on where the biggest opportunity lies, obviously accessing networks, uh, but in addition to that, building the pipeline. All of these things seven years ago, I couldn't tell you that we were going to do these things because I didn't know what to do. But the credit goes to, in large part, to Mr. Robert Rabin. He's on the screen here today. And why does that credit go to him? And I'll conclude with this. He sent a letter to the University of California. And he said, you ain't doing enough. And sometimes letters like this or harsh words that come to each of us as individuals when we're trying to have these conversations openly and honestly and transparently can be very dangerous because we then want to hide and kind of put our head in our pillows and not deal with the issue because it's easier to do that. But Robert encouraged us. I met with Robert and he was the one that gave me the idea to measure the data and start with the baseline. But then that has led to this whole journey we've been on in ways that I couldn't even imagine. So it does take one person sometimes to catalyze a movement. Uh, it's most important that the University of California and UC Investments is not a wave, but we're an ocean. And to be an ocean, we all need to do this together. I'm sure we'll get to some more questions, but as you can tell, Robert has got me riled up on this conversation. And there's a lot we've got to get started to get working on. But again, the team that I've got on here watching today, I can talk about this, but they do it. And that's why I get inspired with all of their actions to be able to have the energy to share this enthusiasm with you about the difference we can all make together. Thank you. Great, fantastic opening. Um, now, Brian, did you did you have any thoughts as well? Sure, Lindsay. Um, I had a couple of thoughts. You, know, you talked about obstacles, and I think there are two big obstacles that come up right at the beginning. And the first is, how do you make a decision to launch an emerging management program or try to bring greater diversity to your managers. And then the second is knowing what to do once you've made that decision. And among the Endowment and Foundation community, which is where I've been a part of for 20 years, there was a tendency not to think that that was automatically a part of our jobs. And it was partly because our organizations do really great things. And so the investment function was supposed to maximize the amount of money available to do that. And partly investment committees were focused more on, well, let's see your performance, let's see how well you've done, not on, well, how well have you done on, it, on diversity? And at the same time, all of these organizations have got diversity, equity, and inclusion as a very important part of their overall approach to the world. And so what you really need to do is realize that's one that cuts across everything. And that as CIO, I'm responsible for that in our investment portfolio, just as much as the program people uh, are on, on the program side. And so I think really understanding that this is a part of the values of your organization that really fall to you to implement is important. And for some reason, not many people saw it that way until a couple of years ago. I will say the Knight Foundation study definitely opened some eyes. And I got many more calls after that first Knight Foundation study came out than I ever had before. Then the other issue is how to, because a lot of people will make excuses and say, well, we can't find them or we don't know how to do it. And I would say, if you have made a decision that you are going to work with minority managers and many, but not all, think about it in terms of emerging managers and newer organizations, then you have to approach it as you do any other new area of investing. And you need to make sure that you get educated on this field. And we did, and I would recommend that anyone do, 
find an advisor, find an advisory relationship, someone who knows the field well. Our advisory relationship took the form of a fund of funds. It could take the form of a consulting arrangement. It could take a variety of things. And that helped us get started, helped us to meet managers, get a feel for what talent was out there. And for our first five years, we used an advisory relationship and it was only at the end of that period that we felt we can now do this ourselves. And so we went ahead and have been managing it on our own since. So, you know, I think it's very important that you think about what are the values of the organization that I'm expected to uphold. A diversity is clearly one of those. And then make sure that you approach this as a challenge that you would approach any other challenge for an investment in the new area. Great. And now Robert and Matt, I'm not sure if you had any additional comments or, or thoughts on, on those res those great responses, um, especially with Jagdeep mentioning Dami and, and Robert's work specifically. Well, I have five older brothers in a very competitive family. I wish I was taping what you said. Uh, very, very, very kind of you to um, point out Dami's role in this, but it was really, and, and I, I throw it right back to you, Jagdeep, and to you, Brian, the importance of personal leadership within an institution. I, I don't have transcripts of board meetings and other conversations that go on between you and other deciders at the institution, but I've been doing this long enough to know that it's not an easy journey. There are some institutions where it's super easy, but my guess is it takes a fair amount of self-confidence, experience, and perseverance to uh, push through on diversity. You can sort of choose to talk about that or not. But one of the reasons we have you on this call today is you've used your brand capital, for lack of a better term, to do something that many others are not willing to do. The pushback from trustees, the questions, uh, they're infused with bias, the implicit notion that working with diversity inhibits performance, all of that remains dominant chords in the profession. But you too have been able to transcend that. If you want to talk about that for a second, it'd be great. If not, it's totally fine. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, so I think the approach I took uh, at UC Investments was not to engage consultants, not to engage advisors out there, but to be personally held accountable for what actions we need to take and how we need to make progress. Um, because I've got to own it, right? I don't want to delegate it to somebody and then say, look, they didn't do a good job at this. It's not my fault. That's certainly not my personal leadership style. Now, with that comes being vulnerable and being targeted sometimes and being um, questioned about you're not making enough progress and you haven't done a good job. And that's okay. That comes with the territory. But that's where, as a leader, you have to remind yourself. And, and in this organization at the University of California, we've been around for 152 years. The issue of uh, the challenges we have with how we treat human beings and people of color and minorities in America is not a new problem. And it's been going on for a very long time. And so um, we really need to take accountability individually. We need to recognize this is a journey. And in doing so, we need to be patient with the progress we can make on that pathway. And so I think owning it yourself is the best way to learn. Because as you learn, you tailor the strategy for your organization and you can hopefully have a lasting impact in what you can do. Now you learn a couple of things in the process, right? Number one responsibility we all have as leaders whether you're in a corporation or in an investment firm or in a nonprofit is that you got to perform. Your shareholders and your community expects you to perform. There's no difference between a diverse manager performing and not performing uh, and, and, and a white manager and for that matter, any other manager, because the reality is the data shows academically and practically that performance is equal or better with the diverse manager set. So that's not really an issue to deal with. As far as, um, you know, 
the challenge of convincing your shareholders and the importance of doing this, it's kind of easy at the University of California. I mean, I was hired and I worked for seven years for President Janet Napolitano, the first woman in the history of a 152-year-old organization to be the president. Now I work for President Michael Drake, the first African-American who is the president of the University of California. So I am surrounded and encouraged and motivated by the diversity and the leadership that is diverse of the University of California. I look at our border regions, the, it's colorful in a diverse way. And so I am encouraged to take action. I have no excuses. And therefore it actually is fun because the story is very well understood and connected all across the university at all levels. Now, what I need to do is make sure that we can make progress to have an impact in, in driving on these agendas. So in that context, the UC Investments Academy gives us sort of something real and an anchor by which we can connect the entire community together. But really, I view this as the only limiting factor is the number of hours in the day my team and I have to be able to make progress. But we are encouraged to do that because it's the right thing to do for America. You know, I'd love to, to jump in here for a moment. You know, Jagdeep, just kind of following up on that. And then Brian, you mentioned you want the consultant route to help you with this process initially. But Jagdeep, when you think about you know, internalizing that effort that you've done, you obviously have the staff to be able to do that. A lot of other organizations don't have the internal resources uh, to, to be able to take on this effort on their own. How do you balance that with also work, you know, requiring the consultants that you're working with to address this issue and make sure that they're putting the effort in to improve their work around this space and, and what that can mean to other clients they may be working with that do rely on them more for um, investment manager research and, and recommendations? Well, that, I'll, I'll take that because that's the route that we went. And again, I think we we felt that we've made this decision and we want to execute on it the best that we possibly can. And from a standing start, felt that we really needed to bring in some people who knew the field uh, and could and could work with us and and learn our way to uh, to to greater knowledge on our own side. And I think it was very effective in that we were able to rather quickly put together an investment portfolio and get to know the managers. And the, um, you know, over time, we, we did see the limits of the advisory relationship because to us, this was our emerging manager program. To them, this was kind of a financial product. And so there were probably more managers in the fund than we would have chosen if we were choosing it uh, from the beginning because they wanted to make sure that they were well diversified and that if one manager didn't do well, it wouldn't really you know, affect their track record. And so one of the things that we did when we stepped in ourselves, we said, we're now, we're, we'd like to be bigger with fewer. And we were able to do that at that point. So you know, I think it's just really important for an organization to understand how do you succeed in, in a new area? And if you can do it on your own, great. But I think you have to be pretty honest with yourselves about what your skill sets are. Matt, Matt uh, to, to build up on Brian's point, I will say that uh, most days I feel short staffed. Um, we manage $160 billion with 30 investment professionals and 15 operations people and less than five risk people. So when you put that together, on average, that's seven billion a person. Industry average is 1.1 billion. By any mathematical definition, we're short staff. Practical definitions, short staff. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little personal uh, journey here. You know, when I uh, when I was being uh, when I got the call to about this job nine years ago. I, I think I was I was comfortably told by the recruiters that I would be the least likely candidate to get this job. And the reason, maybe there were some structural biases, but the reason was I was in Canada. Uh, I wasn't a descendant of David Svensson from Yale. 
I had not worked at a fantastic endowment in this country, in the United States. Um, and I certainly didn't have any US education or all the pedigrees that might make it perfect on a resume to win a large endowment job in the United States at $160 billion. That's kind of intimidating, right? Well, my naive self showed up here for the first interview and 16 interviews later and a fourth last interview uh, session with 14 members. And I can tell you this right now, the chair of the investments committee was not a fan of mine. In fact, I was his least second favorable candidate. He and I talk about that all the time. And, um, but you know what it took? It took a leader. It took a committee um, to get past whatever they might have thought was the traditional candidate who should run an endowment in this country to give me the job out of the pool of candidates to take on the responsibility here at the University of California. Ultimately, when you're investing in anything, by the way, I was an emerging CIO. Thank God the University of California took a shot at an Indian guy coming from Canada who had no UC education. I appreciate the fact, as I've gone over in my career, that emerging means you're just hungry, that you're ambitious. It means you want to do the absolute best you can in life in anything you're given. When I meet a young black kid or a Latino kid or in our campuses or our schools, they're, they're pumped, they're motivated. They're gonna do better than even I've ever done in my life. I want access to them. I wanna make sure that we can connect the dots and they can succeed because I have the ability to help them succeed just like somebody gave me the opportunity to succeed in the role I am nine years ago. You know, that same person, that white man in Santa Monica, Paul Walker, turns out has been my biggest conduit to the diverse community in order for me to invest in some of the interesting businesses like Spring Hill with LeBron James and Maverick Carter or funding something that Drake has done and things of that nature. So when we talk about emerging, I, I got a couple of problems with the word. I think it's a horrible term. Let's just be absolutely clear about that in my mind. The second thing I got a problem with is when you say you're emerging because you have 25% or more ownership. I think that there are great organizations that have chief diversity officers that are pumped to make a difference for those organizations. But those companies are public and they'll never be defined as diverse. That's who I'm going after next. I'm going after my partners that are big, that have great diversity teams and they can supplement and complement and amplify our effort to become more diverse because they have scale. So I think this notion of emerging and all these definitions, yeah, Robert Smith's not an emerging manager. Melody Hobson is not emerging. We don't have a category called emerged, do we? Right? So I think I think we got to look for great people who are motivated, who are hungry, who are ambitious, and who want to make a difference. And you know what? Tonight, we're going to tune into TV and we're going to watch sports tonight, NBA games. How many white people do you see on the court versus black people? Trust me, the reality is those sports teams, all the people that we see in different walks of life, they all have funds. They want to be part of the entrepreneurial community. Our own students. There's a lot of ways in which diversity is the norm. It's not emerging. And we need to be part of that future that is so exciting. But the problem is getting access and getting it fast enough and getting to them early enough. And that's where I think we can have a great time if we get the entire organization motivated around looking for the needles in the haystack that will make us money just like anybody else does. Great, you know, those comments um, kind of touch on one uh, attendee question that has already come in about the policies that address um, what is a definition of an emerging or diverse manager, you know, ownership, investment, staff, um, all that all that stuff, you know, one source of frustration for diverse, diverse managers 
as they look to partner with um, emerging manager programs is the difference in criteria from one institutional LP to another as to what they actually, you know, constitute as diverse. Do you, either of you have any thoughts um, about how to standardize the RFP processes, for example, to help smaller resource constrained uh, GPs with navigating that landscape um, by working with, you know, the Knight Foundation or NAIC, for example? Well, Lindsay, you're right about the definitional problems. You know, the Knight Foundation study, there are long discussions about both the definition of the numerator and the denominator, and that's kind of unavoidable. But I do think when you have a fund where there is a substantial minority or female ownership, you know, that's a pretty obvious case. And I wanted to just go back to something Jag, Jag Deep touched on a bit, because I do think that there are moments in people's careers where being a woman in a minority group member are more difficult than others. And one of them is getting started on your own. And uh, that is a time when, first of all, there's bias against first-time funds. And also most early stage managers are getting, they're funded by people that knew them where they used to be. And so I think we found that we can have the most impact by trying to really identify talented individuals or in the early stages of, of running their own firms. So that's kind of where we have uh, focused. And I'd say that to, if I could change anything, I'd focus even more on that, uh, particularly first time funds in the private side, because that's a really, really difficult thing to do. And, and so, you know, the definitions are, are difficult and you can argue about the numerator and denominator, but I think the underlying reality is something that we all see. Great. And I don't, I don't know if anybody else had thoughts, Matt or, or Robert or, or Jagdeep. Good. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, we can kind of move on to um, one of our other questions, um, specifically with Jagdeep. Um, the University of California Investment Office releases an annual DEI report. Um, how has the implementation of such reporting allowed UC to address pipeline issues among asset managers, and how has it allowed your office to take meaningful steps to increase the number of diverse managers it works with? Sure. Um, so the first, you know, first thing is commit to do a report. Then the big task begins, which is gathering the data, and that takes a while. And the larger your organization, and the more the number of managers you have, that becomes a bigger task all of a sudden. So I think the first year we took a stab at gathering the information and and the data. Uh, was interesting, but we didn't know how to read it positively or negatively, other than no matter which data set you pick in the country, the numbers are always below 3%, however you want to define them, right? And so then obviously in the next couple of years, we've been standardizing the data, cleaning it up, normalizing it, and then we start to get a better baseline. So I would say for the first five years, I, I don't even put a lot of weight into you know the quality of the data, other than knowing that it's directionally getting better and that we're gathering more information. But the more important thing about that data is this. When you actually have to go and talk to your managers to engage them, to supply their information, you get a whole variety of responses from, no, we're not doing that. No, not yet. Or yes, we'll happily do it. And I think in the first couple of years, um, it was interesting to get the kind of responses that we did from our managers. Uh, most of them were very supportive and, and helpful. But they also have a data issue, right? Because they had not potentially been measuring it as well. So that journey, collectively working together, I think the most important thing is it begins a conversation. And so, you know, in our organization, Wendy Pulling, our director of ESG, and Arthur Gamaris, my chief operating officer, fantastic job in having those conversations with our managers. And then every now and then they'll show up in my office and say, are you going to, you're not going to believe this. This manager said, no, we're not going to give you this information. That's when I politely get on the phone and I use Robert Rabin's tactics to, to have, have, a, have a more fun conversation to say, give me more because this is important. But I think, I think we've made a difference in encouraging people to let them understand that this is important to us. Therefore, it ought to be important to them if they want money from us. And I think that's a little bit of a carrot we carry and we should work with that. And that's important because we can't always sit in our offices and think, oh my God, if they don't take money from us, we're going to miss out. 
you know what? There's a lot of new funds out there and there's more private equity funds and there are companies in the index. There are many choices we have. We can go after a lot of other options. This should be one of the criteria we apply to have those conversations. The other thing I would say is to really get a sense of how diverse a firm is. Yeah, you can believe the numbers you get, but I encourage my team to get on the road and go and visit the firm. Because when you walk around the offices of your partners, and yes, there may be two people at the top of the helm who don't qualify as having a diverse firm, but you walk around and there are Asian, there are you know uh, Blacks, there are Latinos. And all of a sudden you start to say, well, this kind of looks like a diverse firm, just may not fit the definitions we put on a piece of paper. So it's those type of intangible, actionable observations that begin conversations that helps improve the quality of the data and reinforces that publishing the data holds us all accountable to take more action. And so we're only four years into it. This will continue forever and ever. Uh, but I think it's the progress that we've seen both from us and from them that has made a difference. Now, we at the end of the day, numbers count. What you measure matters. So for us, if you take all of our assets, which is, let's call it approximately on any given day, 150 to 160 billion, you take out everything that is passive, which is 110 to 115 billion, and then you take out things that are outside of the United States, like in Europe or Asia, where it's a little harder to, to uh, have this discussion at the moment for a whole variety of good reasons. And you focus then on actively traded management in the US. And in that, for us, boils down to somewhere in the 35 to $40 billion range. In that context, when we look at how much of our assets are diverse, because it standardizes at the 25% or the 50% uh, or more definition, that number for us is about 35 to 40%, about 12 to $13 billion. So it's sizable. And by any measure, no matter who you compare us to, it kind of holds you know, the test that we're making progress, but it ain't good enough. It's the journey that's gonna be more important. It's the impact. I don't try to measure how many people have we added in our office as the measure of success, that are diverse, because on a base of 50, if you add five, you've made a 10% progress. But just this last year, we've helped place 60 students out of our three big campuses and internships. That's more people than we have in our office. We're building talent for the future. Those are the types of numbers that are more important to me. So what I'm focused on is not just the standardized data that everybody wants to publish on the emerging managers that they have in their portfolio to look good. But sometimes you need to create new metrics, new data sets, and new pools that can help change the landscape. That's where I'm looking for new ways, innovative, creative ways to make a difference. Excellent. Thank you so much. And um, I will tell you both that we have a lot of attendee questions uh, rolling in. So um, we're going to move on to kind of diving into some of those and, and getting some some answers for those that are uh, watching and, and enjoying um, this great conversation so, for, so far. So first, I'm going to start off with a question from uh, Michael Billings. Uh, he asks, from an LP perspective, how does the needle move for Black LPs broadly if people don't think broadly and most CIO searches target Yale Cubs? Um, between 1985 and present, Yale only hired one Black investment professional in, in 2023. So maybe Brian goes first and then... I'm not really sure how to respond to that. Neither am I. That's why I put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. You know, I I mean, I think that, you know, Jagdeep said it before, and diversity definitely does begin at home as well as in your investment manager portfolio. And that's something that we've worked on for a long time and, you know, have, have made a lot of progress in. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I'll stop there. So look, I'm not Yale. I have deep respect for um, the late David Svensson and, and his uh, predecessor or successor. Um, I'm also not any of the other Ivy League CIOs. And so no matter how you look at it, 
I think the fact is the numbers aren't great. There's more work that needs to be done and progress is slower than we expected. I think we all had a George Floyd moment in this country that was you know, a defining moment for America. Yet there was a burst of progress and it wasn't sustainable at the end after in terms of what money has gone in to the diverse community. So I think I think we can't let these one incidences just things happen for a short while and then we forget about it. This is why I think going back to the comment around Yale, when I I had I had the pleasure of meeting David Svensson and I took 10 people from our office to go and visit with him uh, one day for a full day, actually uh, a few years back. And the thing I learned about him is there is no Yale model. Everybody tries to pretend that they understand what the Yale model is. He was explicit in saying it to us that it's really the culture that's the model. So we spend a lot of time trying to compare ourselves and copy ourselves to others. I think when you're dealing with issues like this, whether it's ESG or climate change or um, you know, uh, adding more diverse managers to your mix, you got to find your own way of doing it. And for us, that has been trying to open ourselves to pipelines and opportunity sets. And it takes a lot of time and effort. We tried working with NAIC successfully, had 100 introductions, picked two. Um, again, to Brian's point, it's all about performance and there are great managers out there and you've got to be selective. That's what you hold each other accountable for. Uh, but there are many more networks out there. And the more you do things, the more people get to realize that you're serious about it and more things start coming your way. So I think what it really boils down to is committing the time, having the energy to sustain yourself, not in short bursts, but over longer time periods, and having that multiplying effect across the organization to be able to do more and more of this. I will say, I will say one thing, and I, I've, I've seen this. I was in a room with at least a couple of thousand folks in the Latinx community. And I've been in rooms with at least hundreds to maybe a thousand folks in the African-American community. I do this as a little experimental test. I actually give my email and my phone number. Actually, let me do that right now. jagdeep.batcher at ucop.edu. Send me an email if you have a suggestion. I find that it's interesting. Um, different communities have different ways of following up with you and responding. And I think... Uh, the only way you learn that is when you actually put yourself out there. And I think that I, I, I actually think the African-American community does a fantastic organized job at coming proactively and, 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 and making sure you know that they're around and they're available and they have opportunities for you. Uh, I would like to see the Latinx community do more of that and, and get more aggressive and proactive about it. And so I think, and I, again, I'm sharing with you my own vulnerable personal observations. And you may not agree with me, that's okay. But this is what I'm learning when I put my email and my phone number out there, 510-987-0260. So for all of you that are watching this, and there's 210 people, if you have ideas and suggestions and opportunities, send it our way. Because the only way I look at diversity is it's just opening yourself up to a whole new set of opportunities. Lindsay, let me um, thank you for all of that, Jagdeep. Let me let me just quickly add two things. One, Jagdeep, I appreciate your personal observations, sort of the corollary to that, and one of the reasons why it's so important to work with outsiders who know what they're doing on diversity. Different people get treated very differently with the same amount of assertiveness. Women get punished for, generally speaking, for the same kind of assertiveness that men are rewarded for. People of color have very similar experiences. Obviously, people of color are extremely diverse. And, and I'm this, this is not to sort of take away your observation and the fact that I wish people were more assertive as well, but know that this is a paradigmatic example of the vetting problem. People get treated wildly differently for the same behavior, depending on whether their name is, is Keisha or not. The second piece, and, and Mr. Billings, I appreciate the question. I'm not going to let these elite universities... I'm not going to be deferential in the way that you two are appropriately so. The, first of all, they're diverse. Harvard, Georgetown, University of California, Duke are absolutely moving, which is great. Princeton, Yale, and Stanford are not only stuck 
but obstinately so. It is a 1950s sort of piss off, we know what we're doing, even though we have an entire professional milieu out there now to help people on diversification. And the really, the galling piece with these elite universities, because I don't think they're any different than some major corporations or some philanthropies that won't put out their numbers. The galling piece is we are talking about elite universities who live and breathe diversity. They file amici briefs in the Supreme Court to defend affirmative action. They can tell you to the millimeter the diversity of their entering class. They can tell you to the millimeter the diversity of their faculty. There is no aspect of the university that is not studied and micromanaged for diversity. But when it comes to believing that black people can actually manage the money, oh no, do we really have a pipeline problem? You really don't have standing to talk about it. So I'm passionate about this because we are talking about closed societies. We are talking about CIOs who make three to five to seven times what the president of the university makes. We are talking about trustees who do not open their mouths to say anything about the lack of diversity in the endowment because they love being on the board and they don't want to pick that fight. And so the imperative, I say all this, even though I sound angry, I'm delighted that the two of you, you have transcended all of this in your own institutions, and I know you've had institutional support, but we need white people at these institutions to stand up and say, we want for our endowment what we want for our student body, but that's not happening. So Robert, um, by the way, I'm just looking on the right here, you got more hearts than I did in what you just said. So uh, you clearly had an impact. And look, I gotta say two things. Number one, um, I think, the investments industry is full of hubris and ego. Everybody across every aspect of the investments industry, it's not just endowments. How dare you tell me, because I'm making millions of dollars, what to do, and you know better than I do what needs to be done. You don't understand. Isn't that the standard line we all keep getting? I think most of my peers, respectfully, on these issues, including climate change and ESG. I think they may have their head stuck in the sand like an ostrich and they don't want to deal with the issue. And they don't want to be told what to do as well. And they're not open-minded. Now, some of that comes from the woke culture and the way the fabric of the political landscape in this country is shaping up and is today, which also makes it almost very difficult in some states the blue states versus the red states and things of that nature to make progress. So it's not as easy as investments and hubris and ego. There are many other complicating factors to it. But here's an example for you. When we went through 100 meetings, we met a particular firm that had three principles that were highly accomplished. I thought it was a phenomenal learning opportunity for my team and I to meet with those three individuals starting a new venture fund for the first time and learn from them. And one of those individuals about, and we didn't spend an hour with them, we spent a day with them. About halfway through the day, I said, and I'll tell you the name in a second, because I asked him last night if it was okay for me to do this. I said, how is it that you, have run a $44 billion PL organization in America, which is the size of the University of California in terms of our PL. And you're having a hard time raising money, Oscar Munoz, chairman and CEO of United Airlines. He said, because, you know, they just think I don't know how to manage money. And I said, that's pretty sad, Oscar, that people like us are sitting here in front of you when we can learn from you. And we, we want to tell you that you can't manage money because you've probably made bigger investment decisions than the $15 million you're trying to raise from us in your entire career to get to where you are as a prominent Latin uh, CEO in America. That's the problem we have, right? It goes back to, Robert, what you said. You don't know how to manage money. You may have been a great CEO. You do not know how to invest money. Uh, you may own an NBA franchise, but that doesn't make you good enough to be an investor. I mean, there are all of these biases and structural issues that come into play as human beings when we are trying to make these decisions. But you know that the biggest challenge, I think, is most people 
are comfortable doing the safer thing. And the safer thing is not taking risk. The absurdity of that is in the investments business, 51% of our def de decisions are likely not going to work out, or actually 49% may not work out, and 51% may work out. And that might even put you in the top decile of performance. But when it comes to this issue, we're not ready to take risk. That's the business we're in. And we can't discount the Oscar Munozes of the world who have been successful CEOs and are Latin and now want to put that talent to invest because they can help build and groom great entrepreneurs through their investment firms to become the next Oscar Munozes or Saul Trujillo's or Brian Collins at Collide Capital and a whole bunch of other people. Anyways, I think, I think there's just too much hubris and ego and you can't tell me what to do in asset management and investments. It, you know, I'd love to jump on that and, and maybe direct it to one, one of the other questions that came through and, and maybe have Brian address this, having, you know, uh, invested with diverse and emerging managers for, um, you know, pretty substantial period of time is, unfortunately, issues around diversity and emerging managers has always um, fallen into a good time discussion. When you get into periods of recessions, you get into periods of performance issues across the broader markets, oftentimes it can get pushed aside. How, how, would, how did you manage that um, or have you managed that? And then also a lot of right now, what we're seeing is re-ups with existing managers. How do you make sure that you're still continuing to keep that line of communication open with those first time funds, as opposed to continuing to invest with diverse managers, but doing it with fund two and fund three and not bringing those new relationships to, to your organization. You know, Matt, I'll take that, but I first want to go back to what Robert said about, because these organizations, universities, for the most part, some foundations too, diversity is at the core of their entire value structure. And as Robert said, in other areas, they're measuring these things down to the millimeter. It's just time for the investment side of the house to recognize that those values apply to them. And, you know, I think one by one, we're seeing that happen because how can you not? But I, I certainly think that the CIO is in a very good position to make it happen either with, you know, without being pushed or even to pull people along. And so that's a real opportunity. And then, you know, Matt, your, your comment um, about what to do. Well, first of all, Markets almost always seem turbulent, you know, and and so I think you just have to. I guess the word is intentionality. You have to say we are going to do this, and having said we're going to do this, we're going to follow through on what we said we're going to do because we do that in everything that we do, and so that way you can connect it back to your your values and your goals and say we're just we're going to carry this out, and we're going to figure out the best way to do it. I can I say something? Of course. And maybe this is completely offside, but I, I I'm looking at the questions myself, and and one of the, the the last ones I'm seeing here triggered something for me, if you don't mind. Um, so the question for everyone's sake is: Hi, I'm Hispanic. I grew up in a Hispanic family and culture, and my family's first language is Spanish. Yet my last name and skin color don't indicate this. Sometimes allocators don't believe that I'm Hispanic, even though New York State and New York uh, City do have certified us. Allocators don't say this, but it's obvious. Can you offer suggestions on how to respond to this? Tell you a story. Um, I hired a young man uh, from UC Berkeley, uh, Martin Scott. And a couple of years, uh, actually six or seven months into it, Martin said to me one day, uh, I'd like to ask you a question about, and Martin's all of 20 something years old. And, and he said, I'd like to ask you a question about, you know, what you're doing to invest in Latin America. And I said, Martin, it's, it's a tough place just generally to be investing in Peru and Brazil and Colombia. And I kind of went off on a diatribe and all the risks that we have in those areas. But I said, Mark, why are you asking? He goes, because I'm, I'm, I'm from Latin America. I grew up there. I was, spent all my time there. I said, Martin Scott? Like, what am I missing? I had no idea that you were from Latin America. He says, well, my name is Martin Scott. <laughs> and it's, it's a little longer than that. But of course, someone with the great wisdom in investment management gave him the advice to change his name to be more adaptable to being hired by an asset management firm. 
Now, I always try to remind him that his name is not Martin Scott, but it is truly something else. And therefore, you know, I've never changed my name, neither of my parents. It's always been Jagdeep ever since I was born. And I was born in Nigeria. I spent 14 years in Africa and my name has never changed. My color hasn't changed. The only thing that changes are the colors of my turbans every single day. But at the end of the day, what is most important is your identity is who you have, is, is who you are. It's what you have. It's your brand. You got to be proud of. And you can't start to hide behind somebody else's identity. Because when an emerging manager shows up to us and they package a fund that looks like the same old boring fund that everybody else has brought, there's nothing exciting about it. But when somebody with a diverse set of colors and perspectives show up and they have fresh thinking, and, and, and again, we all know this, to perform better, you need diversity of thinking and opinion and ideas. That starts to become an exciting conversation. And being different is a positive attribute. It's not a negative. So my encouragement to everybody is continue to remain different. And I agree, there's lots of challenges. It's hard to get in the door. There may be biases, but you know what? Robert and I are gonna keep at it and we're gonna do it. And over time, we are gonna make a difference because it, it may start with a couple of waves, but I do think we have to give credit. A lot of people across corporate America and other parts of you know, uh, the, the industry are at least starting to also do the same things we are around data and publishing their information and paying attention to this. It may be slow, but don't give up because patience and resilience are gonna be important to win this journey. Fantastic. And I know we're, we're nearing two o'clock already. This has been the fastest hour of my life. <laughs> I wish I could moderate this for the rest of the day. Um, uh, are both of you open for for one more question from uh, from our attendees? Okay, great. So I guess uh, this is a pretty appropriate one. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee, but they asked, uh, you know, what is the end goal um, with all this conversation and this discourse? Um, and how do you measure that you've been successful, um, whether that's tracking what you've done better than prior years or looking at your, your peers? Um, so, yeah. Brian first, and then me. I, I guess I'll give you two different answers, because one answer is all the numbers go up, and people feel that the world is now a fairer place. I think the other is the numbers have gone up to the point where people stop asking the question and they just go about their business. And so, you know, I think that's a little bit further out there, but I do think that, but but maybe. The other question is, why will it be different now? And I, I do think that gets back to pipeline and getting young people starting into this business, because that's the only way that after 10 years of learning how to do it, you can start your own firm or be promoted inside of a firm. So we need a pipeline. If we get that pipeline, this problem will be uh, much better off uh, in a decade. All right, uh, Lindsay, for me, the end goal is crystal clear. We have hundreds of thousands of retirees who are banking on if they retire on average at the age of 65, $52,000 a year from the University of California and UC investments. That, before we have a diversity issue in this country, we have a retirement issue in this country. We have a demographic issue around the world. So that is a very crystal clear metric that we all have to work hard in order to find the best opportunities, minimize the risk we take in order to deliver on that promise for our retirees. Now, to do that, we want access to the best opportunities and we can't stop in finding those opportunities in New York on Wall Street. We have to find them all over America and everywhere they exist. We have to find them in Oakland, California. We have to find them in every other part of America. So to do that, we have to be open-minded. And that means not just one person, but my entire team and as many people on my team that believe this is important should be part of this journey to be open-minded. But the ultimate, the ultimate success for me is my children. My daughter, who's 15, 
Meher, and my son, who's nine, Prabnor. In school, they're talking about diversity. They're going to grow up to be leaders that don't have to learn this when they get to a job because their values are going to be ingrained in them at a much earlier age. Our children here and for those of our kids that are watching or parents and those that retire from the University of California, they, are, they, are, they need that retirement income to make sure that their future generations are better prepared for the world that we're moving into. So to me, the ultimate accountability as a chief investment officer is we all remember that we all have a shelf life in any job we are in. There is an expiry day in life. And the time that we're doing what we're doing means we have to set our organizations up, change the culture, lay the foundation for future generations so that when the next person comes on board, they don't question what are our diversity things that we're going to get started on? They know that that is the fabric of the organization that they're a part of. But our children are the ones that are going to hold us accountable to be successful in what we do. And it's kind of embarrassing that we're getting onto this bandwagon late. The reality is they're getting onto it early. And I think we can learn at the University of California. I can learn from the Martin Scotts or Martin Scott. I can learn from the Chase Griffins at UCLA. I can learn from my daughter, Meher and Prabnor about how I can be a better leader and hold myself accountable to be successful to deliver on the retirement promise. Fantastic, and, and what a way to, to end this webinar, lay the foundation, um, indeed. So I, I want to, say thank you to Brian and Jagdeep for, for sparing some of your time this afternoon um, to, to talk and, and have this great discussion and to answer some of these attendee questions that have come through. And thank you, Robert and Matt as well um, for, for giving your comments and, and your thoughts on all of these topics. There's a lot of clapping hand emojis. <laughs> so I'm gonna take that to, uh, to, to see that this was a great, uh, a great discussion. So thank you all. Um, and on behalf of EMM, um, we are going to be having some exciting features coming up as well. Um, we have a pipeline feature um, as pertinent to this discussion in our May issue coming up, which looks at the diversity and mentorship and 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 our CIO roles and, and in the industry. Um, and you may know um, for our attendees, the previous webinar, the first installment um, is available on Dami's YouTube page. This one will be as well. So if you have industry peers or other folks that may have missed out on today's discussion, um, you can rewatch and uh, spread the uh, the good word of, of what we heard today. So um, thank you all again. Um, thank you for attending and uh, have a great Thursday afternoon. Right. Thank you. And thank you for all the good work that you guys are doing in, in, in keeping us accountable and inspiring us to make progress and sharing the best practices with us, because that's super important for us to continue to learn as well. Appreciate all of you. Okay. Thank you. Really enjoyed thank you. it. Thank you. Thanks so much.